Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, firstly, thank you very much for inviting us into UCB College. Uh, you've made us incredibly welcome today, so thank you very much. Um, why are we here today? We're here to celebrate hospitality as an amazing career choice. Uh, we as the staff canteen decided we would put on a, a, a series of uh, college tours because there's a huge amount of negativity in hospitality. Too long hours, too short pay, so on and so forth. It's an amazing career. It's a fantastic career. You can travel all around the world. There are so many opportunities. And what we've assembled is a panel that's going to talk to you about the amazing career choices they've had, and hopefully that can inspire you. Um, we as the staff canteen couldn't put on events like this without the help of sponsors and partners. Um, we are working with Hospitality Action, who sadly can't be here today. Uh, we're also working with the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts, who sadly can't be here today. It's like an academy of speech, isn't it? Um, but we are delighted to have, um, first and foremost, Katie from Alaska Seafoods, who's going to say a few words to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Isa will do it. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm not going to bore you with a really long speech. I just uh, want to thank you guys for for this activity today with you in Birmingham, and um, we are happy to be here. Um, I'm from Alaska Seafood, as you saw me downstairs, um, and we're happy to give you all the information about wild fish from Alaska and the importance of sustainable in Alaska and all the fish that we produce in the fisheries. Um, I hope you all have the recipe books. If you don't have, we have more, so please just make sure to grab one. And we are here if you want to chat after the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then last but by no means least, um, Paul de Costa Greaves from Copic Crest. Hi everybody. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so Copic Crest um, is the um, the innovators behind the microgreens, um, based in the Netherlands. And what Copper Crest do is they basically f work on education, education, and an education. And this is really important because yourselves are coming into a fantastic career choice that opens the door. And the interesting thing with Copper Crest is that they're, yes, they're based in Holland, but on a global basis, like you chefs, they're in every country that is possible. And the support and the elements on how you're taking flavor profiles using plants as ingredients, they're there to give you that stepping stone should you should need it. And again, um, if you need any more information, we've got all that info for you. Okay, uh, sponsors. <laughs> okay, there's a man up there telling me we're going live in one minute, so just bear with us for one minute. How many of you, you here are in the first year? First year students? Okay, second year students? Third year? Is there a fourth year? No. Yeah. Is there a fourth year? Well, that's the end. Okay. So we've got a really nice sort of mixture of years and levels. Year. All chefs? <laughs> okay, we're live. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to uh, the Staff Canteen Live College Tour. Uh, you've all heard what we're doing here today, so I won't go through that again. What I'm going to do is introduce you to Cara Houghton. Cara is uh, our editor. She's part, she heads up the editorial team. She makes everything happen on, on the Staff Canteen. Hopefully in a few years' time, she'll be calling one of you for an interview or a feature on the Staff Canteen. Um, Cara's assembled an amazing panel today. She's going to introduce the panel for us. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, just uh, uh, to say hello to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to start with um, Akhtar on the end there. Uh, if people don't know, he's the chef owner of Opheme, but also a uh, multiple award winning uh, restaurateur, entrepreneur. If you've not opened it, it's not worth knowing about in Birmingham, is it? So, um, and obviously people might know him from uh, his restaurant at Lassan, which was the first Indian restaurant in the UK to be selected as the best local restaurant by Gordon Ramsay on Channel 4's uh, The F Word. Uh, in 2011, he won the fish course in the final for a uh, great British menu. And uh, you left the Lassan group in 2016 to work on uh, your flagship project, which is a theme. And you also launched uh, at the end of last year, your Italian restaurant, which has got two pronunciations. <laughs> Lenya, is that Lenya, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, yes, uh, welcome to Akhtar. Thank you. Um, and then next to you, we've got David Lysel, who is the executive head chef of Alton Towers Resort. Um, he's previously, previously executive chef at the Hotel Football for GG Events and Catering. 
Uh, David has a background in uh, menu engineering, catering, all food production management within hotels, restaurants, events, privates, and the uh, stadia operations. So welcome, David. Um, next, we've got Louisa. So Louisa, um, she's worked in a couple of restaurants in Birmingham already. She worked at Adams, and then she was junior sous chef at The Wilderness in Birmingham when she took part in Master Chef for Professionals in 2017, which is where you may recognize her face from. Um, you made it, uh, she made it to the final. And from there, you, she went on to work at two mission starred uh, restaurants at Baines. And she now works as a private chef and does regular pop-ups and, and other events as well. So, And uh, finally, uh, Rob Palmer. Uh, Rob is the head chef at Peel's restaurant in Hampton Manor. Um, he has achieved a Michelin star and four AA rosettes, which he achieved within the same week, I believe, which is quite impressive. Um, and you've never never worked in a Michelin star kitchen before, so equally Im impression, Im impressive. Um, joined Hampton Manor in 2009 as junior sous chef and became head chef five years later. And previous to that, worked at two rosette level, honing his skills and learning his craft. So that is our panel. Um, so to start with, the first question uh, that I have today is, what was the best piece of career advice that you were ever given? So Akhtar, let's start with you. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I think it's all uh, it's centered around one word, and that's respect. So whether it's respect for the trade, respect for yourself and developing yourself as a, as a, as a person and your skills, uh, respecting your ingredients, respecting the environment that you're in, the business that you're working for. And, and all your colleagues as well. And if you can do all of that, and if you know, if if, if everything centres around that, that word, you know, that, that'll put you in good stead in this industry and in any industry, to be honest. So that's that's probably the first major lesson I learned, and it's stuck with me, yeah. and it's served me well. Okay. And Louise, there's something you agree with. I know um, when I asked you these questions, you said that you also were told to do something that excites you. Is that is that? Yeah, definitely. It's good to. Do what interests you and what you're passionate at. It's worth taking risks in life because if you don't take risks, you don't see yourself improving or going anywhere. So that would be my my thing: take risks and do things out of your comfort zone. Okay. And, and David, what about what about yourself? Uh, mine was to just just to learn really. Uh, just you can never know everything. And just keep learning. You pick up stuff off off all to walks of life as you learn your trade. And just keep wanting to learn. Have that hunger to learn and just focus on that and never sort of sit back and just get bored or get stagnant and just learn, learn, learn. That's my sort of theory behind things. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And obviously the, the advice uh, that you've received, Rob, what advice would you give students who are, you know, entering into the industry just at the very beginning of their career? I mean, apart from the obvious, obviously work hard and ask, always ask questions, ask a lot of questions, don't ask silly questions, but ask sort of intelligent ones and think about it and and then probably the best, best piece of advice I was given a bit further on in my career when I was sort of getting to sort of sous chef level was sort of and designing my own dishes and that is have a bit of restraint in what you do. Like always know when to sort of take something away or instead of adding something, it might be something that needs taken away to the dish. And yeah, that, 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 that helped me a good stead for my career. And I think since becoming head chef, I think my food's quite restrained and. No, it's not too over complicated. Don't over manip manipulate ingredients. I think that's really important. Okay. And David, you work in a very different sector to, to everybody else on, on the panel. So what, what advice would you give students? And would you encourage them to, to think outside the box? It's not just about fine dining. Yeah, very much so. Um, not everyone's cut out to do fine dining and that sort of thing. It's very, very similar to, you know, I suppose a football, te a football team. Not everyone's designed to play in the Premiership straight away. You know, you need to train and learn and sort of get into w actual working life and see what it's like being in a, w in a working environment with professionals and approach it that way rather than just saying, I've, I'm, a, I'm a chef now, I have to go work in a Michelin star restaurant. You know, there's, very, there's loads of different ways you can do it. You know, you've got schools, prisons, um, care homes, all sorts of things like this where we can sort of adapt our chef skills if you like to. Um, I employ people that f do from a casual dining, um, fast food sort of environments right the way through to fine dining restaurants in one resort. So we look at different skill sets for different parts of the resort we put pe where we put people. Okay. And Louise, I suppose that's something you're kind of playing with at the minute, what direction you're going in, because you've, you've done the Michelin Star restaurants. Yeah, I've done a bit of everything, everything really. So I started off in hotels and two rosette restaurants, 
with, with like big large numbers, weddings, banquet, you know, it's totally different to fine dining. Whereas I preferred working in the Michelin side, just restaurant without the room service kind of side because you could focus a lot more on the food itself. Um, but yeah, it's totally different. Everyone's different. It doesn't suit everyone. You know, it just depends on your style of cooking and the passion that you have and where you want to be in the future. Okay. And um, that's obviously very, very successful. Did you have um, career goals in mind? Did you think, I want to do this by a certain point? Or did you set yourself goals? No, I, mean, I, I set goals at various periods in life. So when I left my last group and moved away from that, I set new goals which I'm working towards now. Um, but something that's always been very much part of everything I've done, it's always, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Brummie. I was born and brought up, I was born on Dudley Road. I grew up in Aston. I lived most of my 20s in the jury quarter. So my life is very much, I'm probably one of the only people quite happy at the end of a holiday to look forward to coming home because I actually love, love, love Birmingham. So the, 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 the main goal that I've always set myself is to add value to my city and I think I, I learned very, because in, in my teens I spent a few years living in London and realised that it's quite fashionable to bash Birmingham. So I've always said, I always say that to all my friends and colleagues, um, if we don't do it ourselves, no one else will. So I think you know, as a Brummie, it's very much part and parcel of our duty to invest in our city. And that's why I always continue to invest in, in Birmingham and ensure that any investments that I get involved in are centred around the city. So that's the the overriding goal. But yeah, you know, goals you set yourself with that in various periods in your life. And you know, I've got a new 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 goal that you know, well, I was working towards. So Summer Road to redevelop Summer Road. So we've done two properties there, two two restaurants there already. We've got the hotel, which has been the planning's been granted for that now. So we've got the hotel, a boutique hotel going in, and then another restaurant. And then we're moving towards properties in. Bath and we're doing projects there as well but it is very much centered around investing in Birmingham. Okay and so career goals do you think are important so you don't stagnate so you keep climbing? Yeah of course yeah it's, it's all about uh, one of the things I always say to every because we've got a lot of students from the college that work with us and uh, young individuals and the thing I think we can all I'm sure there's people here from various parts of the world but um, one thing that we have here is We've got that luxury where we don't have to think about day-to-day -day survival. You know, we've got that luxury where you know that's not a worry. So we've been given this this it's 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 a privilege. And so what do you do with that? And the right thing to do then is 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 to develop yourself and 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 do what you can to add value to your environment, to your trade. It's all about. I don't want to use the term legacy. It's, 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 but it's all about what can you add, and we're in a position now where, as 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 people in this environment, we don't have to worry about the the basics of survival. What we have to worry about, and what we should be worrying about, is how do we make ourselves as individuals the best person or the best form of ourselves that we can, and that's what we should concentrate on. And that obviously involves, in, if you're in hospitality, how can you make yourself the best chef? or the best front of house personality. And that's what it should be about. It should never be around trying to find the easy route or uh, uh, cutting corners here and there because we've got this privilege and it's this privilege that we have to exploit and make the most of. So, uh, you know, for sure it's, you know, goals, whether it be personal development, financial, business, whatever, it's all about every day, make yourself better in whatever aspect you can. And Rob, I asked you the, the question and you were very like, you said, oh, head chef by 30, mission star by 35, is that right? Yep, and own yeah. your own restaurant by 40, so. Think, yeah, they were sort of goals you have in your own head, whether you stick to them, I mean, you don't live by them, like, because the goalposts can always move, like, something might happen, something else might happen in your life that might be more significant than your career, but um, they were my personal goals and so I achieved them sort of before, when I'm 32 now, so. I achieved them a lot before. I haven't got my own restaurant yet, but that's the next one. <laughs> but whether that ever happens or not, I'm not going to sort of be really disappointed if it don't, because I've done really well. I'm proud of what I've achieved, and there's always something else out there that you can achieve as well as as well as the goals you set for yourself. There's always something around the corner you might not be expecting that might might be the next bigger picture. You don't know. Um, yeah. That's yeah. It. 
Okay. And Louisa, you're obviously still quite early in your career. And then I, I know when I spoke to you about this question, you said that until you were 16, you didn't even want to be a chef. So have you, yeah. is that career goal something you've thought about? Yeah, well, I always kind of enjoyed cooking at home and I never really thought I'd see myself being in the kitchen professionally cooking. Um, but later on in my career, that, that changed. And it's good to set goals, but set goals that are achievable so that you don't feel bad about not achieving it. Um, and it's always good to set goals that are completely bonkers because that's absolutely fine and everyone does that right and it's good because you have something to work towards and um, yeah I would definitely recommend setting goals in, in your career. So we've, we've talked about goals um, so do you feel like you've all succeeded in achieving a lot of those goals mm -hmm. and um, was there ever a time where you thought that you'd actually picked the completely the wrong career path? Um, David, let's, let's start with you. In terms of career path, um, I tried, I was a kitchen porter at, at school sort of thing, and I tried everything not to become uh, into the catering. I, I fitted tyres on cars, I stuck labels on grinding wheels, I did warehouse work, all sorts of different things, because at the time I, I thought, Catering wasn't wasn't for me, and then I sort of needed. I was at Loose End, and I bumped into the head chef I used to work for, and then I was washing dishes for him. And then before I knew it, I was on the salad section, and then it was making doing, doing, doing the garnishes and stuff like that. And I turned around and, was, and I, I, I didn't think I wanted to do this. I thought I don't want to fall into this job. It was it wasn't something that I thought I would have had a skill set to do because no one I'd never taken interest in it at school or anything like that. So it was just I was just at home. Uh, it was pancake day, mum was making pancakes and um, she was making them, they weren't working because the, the batter wasn't thick enough. So I said, this, this is wrong this, so I took <laughs> it off her, and obviously it was the argument, you know, she followed the recipe and I said, just not right. So I made the pancakes for her, made the batter thicker for her and the pancakes turned out perfectly and my mum said, just you know, why don't you do this, you've got a, you've got a talent for it, you've, pick, you've learned how to do this and well, that was 22, 23 years ago, so yeah, I certainly fell into it that way really. Yeah. And Louisa, you said that um, you did question it when you were peeling 20 kilos of potatoes <laughs> for a yeah. wedding the next day. So, but obviously you're very clear now. Some jobs in the kitchen, especially when you're younger, more towards a commie chef, like a lot of jobs can be quite tedious. Um, like picking peas out of pods for hours on end and things like that. Someone has to do it and you'll have to do it at some point in your career. At the end of the day, it's, it's a job that needs doing. And um, at that point, yeah, you do kind of think to yourself, why am I doing this? But then you get the service side of the kitchen as well, and you, and you have a, like a really good service, and you get to the end of service, and you're just like the adrenaline is like running, and you're just like really happy that you've just completed something almost impossible. So yeah, yeah. And Akhtar, would you agree? Did you did you always want to to be a chef, and do you think you've kind of succeeded in? No, I think I think for me it, was, it came quite naturally. So I've been uh, my earliest cooking memories was as young as seven. So. By the age of nine, ten, I was cooking for my family, so uh, cooking was something that I found I took to quite easily. And then the restaurant environment, because we've had restaurants in the family, and my, my, my great grandfather was a restaurant in the 50s, so it's always been part and parcel of it. So it's something, an environment that I was quite au fait with. Um, obviously, my parents were very upset when I decided that that's the. Uh, I wasn't going to become a doctor or. or <laughs> can you imagine me? Yeah? Um, but yeah, so. Um, but. Yeah, it's taken them 26 years, but they're okay with it now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for me, it's always been, I th I've, I've always had, um, I don't know, there's loads of terms that they put towards it now, but I th I've always been quite hyperactive, so I, I always needed something that took took my attention and, 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 and made me expend energy. So one thing we have with hospitality, and especially in restaurants and kitchens, is, is work and lots of it. So I found myself very much at home there. It, uh, calmed me down, it gave me focus, so for me it, it was a natural fit and I think it's made me a better person. Okay. And talking about success, obviously you, Rob you got um, your Michelin star but you said actually that was in one of your toughest years. So yeah, cause I think it was around February I lost my team of six and I lost three of that team in the space of like three weeks. They all went on to move, one moved on to be head chef, one moved on to be, be sous chef and then another one just moved on and it was just and then a month later, I, we had that, like, me and my wife had a daughter and it was just like balancing everything around that time, so having half a team and 
not being at home to see them sort of really important parts of like your daughter and that. And then but at the end of that year, we won a star as well, so it was sort of like really rewarding at the end of it. But and obviously having a baby was pretty rewarding as well. It was just a lot of it was just a lot of lot a lot of things that were really difficult at that time in that in that year. But yeah, so it did make me think then. Obviously not knowing it was going to win a star at the end of it, but yeah, that was a really difficult year. And like, there's other things that happen, like, obviously that the hours are long and whatever, but you sort of get used to that. And I think as a chef, when you've been doing it for so long, if you didn't have, if you didn't do all them hours, you probably wouldn't know what to do with your time. To be yeah. Fair. So um, yeah, that yeah that was when I did question whether I'd made the right choice or not <laughs> when it comes to family and yeah. my own family. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously it just shows that the positives do come out yeah, of that definitely. hard work. Yeah, definitely the hard so. work. It is rewarding, so okay, okay. You get what you put into it. You get out what you put into it eventually. So. And and sticking with Michelin, your you, your background isn't Michelin yeah. restaurants. You know, you've staged in Michelin kitchens, so it's not yeah. like you've never worked in them before. But what would you say to students about that? Because obviously, you your foundations are not Michelin. You don't have to go um, straight in. It to weren't for the, it weren't for the want of trying not trying to get into them. As I was just at the time, I was trying to get. In. I was trying probably not. Exp I was trying to stay in Birmingham, but. Nobody ever left them kitchens around that time, so nobody ever left Penals to get into his team. And same at Simpsons and places, so I always sent CVs, but I was never recruiting at the time. So I just grafted and carried on working where I was working, and then did the odd stage here and there where I could. And I think that's important. Like using it, if you want to really put, like progress in the in your industry, then you you got to put your, you like say I get you get out what you put into it. And um, I went and worked on the holidays and sort of did a stage in different Michelin star places across the country and yeah and it's it's paid off eventually so yeah yeah and Louise obviously you worked in uh Zach Bain's kitchen two star what what was that experience like and would you is it something you think young chefs can go in and do or is it quite tough um yeah I definitely recommend um for younger people to go into Michelin because it's almost like you learn the right way straight away and you, when you're younger you have a lot more energy you're a bit more kind of focused you, you know, you're more likely to do what you're told because you don't have a big head and you don't think you can do it a better way. Um, so for me, like, I've worked in Mission and I've done it and I'm really glad that I've done it because I've learned so much from it and you learn so much in such a short period of time because mm -hmm. you do work a lot of hours but what you put into it, you know, as Rob said, you get a lot out of it and um, it's, yeah, it's a great experience. Definitely do it while, she, while she's young if you're going to do it. It's a lot easier to kind of fall into it that way. Once you've done one place, you can go to another place. Um, if you don't particularly enjoy one chef's style of cooking, you can try a completely different style. There's so many different range of different types of restaurants around in the UK. Okay. And uh, David, events and, and catering is uh, such a huge numbers in comparison to like the smaller, the, the fine dining. Would you recommend that as a, as a career a path and what are the benefits of, of that that maybe you don't get from working in a in a, a fine dining kitchen? Um, I suppose with events and catering, um, there's, a, there's a lot of planning to be out there goes that goes to it um, in terms of venue because uh, with a lot of events we load into we load into uh, the Manchester Cathedral and there's no kitchen in the Manchester Cathedral, so you, we've got to build a kitchen there to serve up to 500 600 people out of there. Um, so it's great the, all the planning and it teaches you a lot to sort of think on the think as you as you think on your feet if you like, um, because you've got so many different variances that can change. You know, we we could have all of a sudden have half a vegetarian or a lot of dietary requirements or something like that. So we need to be able to plan it in the plan it in the first instance, but then to execute it, we need to be able to sort of have a really can do attitude and get ready for it and make sure we're covered all, in all our aspects really. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also do very, very small, we've also done very, very small events where it's very, very intimate, you know, around people's houses and stuff like that, um, where you're sort of working in the house, in someone's house with the family in their kitchen. Um, so it's very diverse ev events work, is it? but you do have to think on your feet quite a lot. Yeah, and actually, obviously having your own restaurant, you can be a great chef, but how important is it to also understand the business side as well? Yes, it's, 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 it's equally as important because, like, it's 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 great, you know, the cooking side of it, that's your passion and you know, that's a bit that we all enjoy. But then the other side of the back of house stuff and, and making sure that the business is in a good position, whether it be financially, uh, all the legislation that we have to deal with and, and all the administration. Sadly, that's part and parcel of it, but you can't pick and choose. It's it's all 
very much part of the part of the the, the, the job role. So for me, it's not my favourite part of it. But you know, I dedicate two days a week um, to that, and then I've got an assistant who carries it on whilst I'm not. So it's having the right support allowing me to still continue in the kitchen. But it's you know it's it's essential. So you can't pick and choose, and you've got to make sure that you put just as much effort in getting that right as you do on the front end, on the service end, on the customer end, because it's pointless having, and we've had all heard of situations where people have had fantastic restaurants, they've achieved stars, and the following day they've had to close their restaurant mm -hmm. because the other parts of the business have not looked after, so yeah. it's very important. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we've talked about success, um, so maybe we talk about some of the challenges that you've kind of faced in, that, in terms of getting to that success. And uh, Rob, you said that uh, someone got a promotion over you that you didn't feel was very fair. So how did you deal with that kind of um, challenge in your career? I just got on with it and well, worked through it and probably learned from it. I, when I look back, it was a head chef position. So before I got the head chef position, so I, I thought at the time I was probably ready for it. But in hindsight, when I look back now, I don't think I was ready for it. So I learned from it and I spent 18 months as his, uh, then behind him and then after 18 months I was given the head chef job and I thought at the time then like I looked back and I thought it was probably the right right, new, right right decision not to give me the head chef job and to give this other person it and then about two years after getting the head chef we had a star on four years it so it sort of it it taught me a lot just to get on with it and don't don't be don't be put off by it and yeah to learn, learn when things don't have go in your way learn from it and realise why they didn't go your way and, and just get on with it and keep keep working hard towards what you want to do because eventually if you set them goals and you really want to get to them goals like we spoke about earlier you'll, you'll get there eventually as long as you've got the right attitude for it. Okay and Louisa what about you what about a, a challenge that you've kind of faced so far in, in your career I know you said that, that um, you didn't want to get you don't ever want to get bored that's one thing and you have good days yeah. and bad days but you've got to kind of yeah everyone has good days and bad days in the kitchen sometimes you can get almost too comfortable in the kitchen I guess and that's when you kind of need to tell yourself am I doing something that where I'm learning or do I need to move somewhere else and go somewhere where I'm actually going to learn that's that's a challenge in itself just realizing that really because if you're not if you're working for someone and they're not teaching you anything more than you already know and you've worked there for a long period of time and you've you know you've done you've done your time then and you've got to decide it's time to go on that's a big step to take especially if it's your first job as well yeah. um, but challenges in general like if you don't necessarily, if something doesn't go your way, then just try again, just keep persevering because in the end it will all work out. Yeah. Um, but that's what I would say anyway. Okay. And David, I particularly liked your challenge that you started working with a new property and you didn't have the stuff that you needed. So you went to another property and <coughs> borrowed, stole yes. yeah, <laughs> some yeah. sandwiches so that you could start trading. Yeah, we had, um, we, we, so we took over the uh, National Football League in Manchester. And the initial plan was we'd, we'd go in and, and on the Friday, close the weekend, get ourselves sort of set up properly and then start trading again on the Monday. But the actual small print said we had to start trading straight away. So um, it was match day at Hotel Football. So on match day we have lots and lots of staff and we have, they have sandwiches and pies as their staff too. So, uh, me and the general manager at the time got the uh, work van, went and stole half of it. Um, <laughs> And then started trading the, the, the same day at the, the football museum, and um, yeah, it was. It was again, it's about picking your feet and having a can-do attitude and thinking, right, what can we do? Because quite a lot of time, lots of people were just going, oh, this is, we can't do it. We're not, we're not doing this right. But we had, we had no option, you know. We had to get the, we had to get it done, so we we did. Yeah, and obviously this panel here today is we want. Um, everyone to understand how um, amazing the industry is, what a positive career choice it can be. Um, so what would you like the industry to do more of to make it more appealing to, you know, to, to get it across to young people that it is an amazing career actor? I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think it's, 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 it's a lot wider than the, what the industry can do. So we're, we're at the UCB here, and I've worked very closely with the uh, the UCB over the years, not purely because of geographical reasons, it's because I'm really passionate about what they do and I believe in what they do and I think they do a fantastic job. So um, I'd say there's a couple of people here who, who are part of my team, but a high proportion of our team across the entire estate are students from Swiss. So I think they're doing a fantastic job there. 
as an industry, can we do anything more? Um, I think a lot has changed. I think people realize now with our industry that it is, it is quite exciting. Yes, some, we, we shouldn't lie and dress it up and say to people, yeah, it's, you know, you get every weekend off, you have all the, 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 the event days off and so on and so forth, because it doesn't work like that. We need to be honest with everyone, tell, tell them as it is, but you know, make sure that we, we, we coach and encourage people as opposed to how it used to be before where we, we beat discipline into people, whereas now I think the, it has changed already. It is all about coaching and encouraging. Yes, there are uh, times where you have to pull someone aside and, 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 and get them to, 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 to get in line, but that's part and parcel of any industry. But I think, yes, as the industry, can it do more? I think we're doing enough already. I think it's very clear. You know, the working conditions have changed. You know, so we used to do 19, 20 hour days, seven days a week. Right? Now most restaurants are five days a week, especially on our level as our mind. So you know, you've got those, that balance between work and life and making it interesting for everyone. Is every day a learning day? Well, I'd like to say it is within our business and it is pretty much in all the restaurants at our level, it, you know, we, we're, we're constantly spending a lot of time developing new stuff. So you're engaging people and, and, and making everyone, you know, everyone, every member of the team, challenging them to be better, better chefs. So you get a lot back from it. And money-wise as well, it's actually good money. I know a lot of it, um, there's been a lot of uh, bad press about that, but actually in reality, compared to most roles within admin or, or certain um, roles where there's no barrier to entry so you don't need qualifications so on so forth something like in hospitality you don't hospitality pays a lot more certainly within our business so and I'd, I'd like to say that it's representative of the industry yeah and obviously it offers you some uh, very exciting opportunities and you've, you've worked in TV because of, of what yeah. you do is it was that something that you enjoyed that side yeah no, I, I love it and I, it's something that you know I'm, I'm looking to do a lot more this year because last year I spent a lot of time working with the businesses so I, I didn't want to uh, you know take my focus off that but this coming year I'll be doing a lot more of it but then in a TV side I've traveled the world I've I've cooked for some incredible people and met incredible people and made friendships with incredible you know, icons within our, our generation and it all happened because I just ha happened to cook mm. and nothing more. And you know, These opportunities are still there, if anything, more and more so. We, we often get, and I'm sure the same happens with everyone on this panel, we, we get invited to cook at all these weird and wonderful places throughout the world and if you've got the opportunity to say yes and in our always try to say yes because you go to represent not only do you go to see these beautiful parts of the world but you go to represent your city and represent what you do and take it to somewhere else so it's great opportunities yeah yeah okay and louisa what about you because obviously you've experienced mass chefs of professionals as well so that's a, another side of of being a chef did you enjoy that and then we'll maybe talk about the things that you would like to see change within the industry yeah that for me was like really big risk to take and it kind of just happened all so quickly like entering it and stuff and obviously I knew there was a risk of going on there and and making a mistake and making myself look like an idiot which uh, some people do but you know mistakes happen and realistically it happens all the time in the kitchen but um, obviously going on to TV was a big thing for me like I'm, I'm not the most confident person and I thought it was a big risk for me to take and at the end of the day I could either lose or win it there was some two options or just do really badly um, and I didn't win it, but from what I've got out of it now, I didn't need to win it. Like I've done yeah. really well. I've had so many opportunities come from it. Um, I've met some fantastic chefs. I've worked with some brilliant chefs. Um, met some lovely people. Dining experience, like Apta was saying, like getting invited to people's homes to cook for them, is like another level of cooking because you do everything from like the washing up to the cooking to the plating to serving, which is a completely different experience to when you're like tucked away at the back of the restaurant so it opens up so many doors mm. just with your experience of, well when you get older and you've had that experience in your time in the kitchen these sort of these sort of like opportunities come and you get to travel with that which is obviously an amazing thing to do yeah and anything you'd like to see change within the industry or um to be honest with you i think it is starting to get better in the industry i'm not going to coat it up but like some restaurants can be like very tough to work in a lot of chefs are very old school and 
they like their ways of you know discipline which is fine but as long as you respect the people that you work with at the end of the day you shouldn't have any issues um it can be a little bit better i think there is still some bullying in the industry going on i'm not going to lie but that's going to get better over time and the only thing that we can do is support each other and not bully each other to start with and then and be friends and work with the people that you enjoy working with and then you're not going to have any issues yeah okay and uh, david what about you from the kind of starting to to now do you think the industry's progressed and do you think there's th are there any particular things you'd like to see change or yeah from when i started it um it was a different industry hence why i didn't why i first said i didn't, didn't want to go into it it was, it was perceived as long unsociable hours every weekend you had to work there was um, a lot of marriage breakdowns and stuff like that but it, for me the industry's come pretty much full circle as far as i'm concerned whereas you know i think people's perception of the industry needs to change it's not all about 16 hour days seven days a week every weekend you know you do get time off and you do get a work-life balance there is there's a job for someone out there if it's not if that's the lifestyle you want then fine and you can go for that and i'm not saying it's, not, it's a bad thing to do however i think there's a lot more the industry is a lot more needs to see itself as being more approachable than what it has done in the past i think and i think it needs to be sort of fed into people at a younger age rather than like it's like at school i like to see a lot more sort of cookery stuff happening at school really yeah yeah and rob obviously at, at peel you said you've got quite a nice work-life balance now <coughs> we, we yeah we do now it never used to be like that but we've sort of built towards it so we've got a separate team for peel's restaurant which is i'm head chef rather than there's another team for the rest of the hotel for the events and the weddings and everything but and we do pretty because we don't do lunch we do straight shifts well, they can choose to do a split or a straight i, I, I do a row and they do a couple of splits a week a couple of straights a week but it's more than just working hours i think it's like yeah it's still probably more hours than, than there is in most other jobs that you go into but i think it's about enjoying what you do and giving like we do something called we call it we just call it chef's lunch so every couple of months i give all the junior chefs sort of a, an ingredient to work with and then they come up with a dish with using that ingredient and then we all sit down and have a lunch time we eat it and I have like a four or five course tasting menu between us. It's quite a big investment for the business as like obviously we, I don't I don't give a, I don't go on cheap ingredients, we give it I give them sort of what we use in the on the restaurant on the menu now, but it gives like younger people a voice to sort of get something on the menu even maybe. I mean not very often everything gets to the menu but they've had a voice to see like how you go from the start to finish of developing a dish and maybe getting it on the menu and taking criticism about that dish that they've put up or getting praise for it one or the other like it just it gives like youth a voice and I think that's important I think that's something that the industry needs to do a bit more of and, and invest in invest in a little bit more and then you'll get more back from them I think and I see that in the younger ones that like if I give them that chance to work on something they'll come up to me and they'll keep asking me more asking me more questions and asking the right questions like I said earlier about that ingredient or about a dish that they want to work on and I think having a voice and giving youth a voice is, uh, is important. Yeah. And obviously we've got a room full of students today who are potentially going to carry on into, into the industry so what would you say um, that they, they can expect from a career in hospitality now? What would, what, what would be their expectations? Um, like I said, you, you're going to do a few more hours than what you do if you go and work in a, I don't know, in a bank where it's nine till five or something like that. But it's it's rewarding. It's not. It's every day is different, and you're going to learn something every day. It, yeah, you'll be doing the same jobs, but you might learn one chef's method of doing it and another chef's method of doing it, right or wrong. One of them might be, but you'll learn you'll learn something. Like it's, it's every day. It's a school day. It's a bit that, that bit cliche, but it's true, and it's rewarding at the end of it when you get to the the highest level if, if you've got ambitions to win mission start and whatever like when you get there it's it's incredible like it's it's like it's like being a footballer winning the premier league yeah. i suppose like if you win a mission start there's not many there's not many people that can do that so if you want to get to that you, it's, it's hard work but it is very rewarding at the end of it every day is rewarding at the end of the day you, you're cooking for someone it's, it's a necessity to eat in life so and people why not enjoy it and that's what you're getting people to do is enjoy what they're eating and yeah yeah Louisa, what about you? What what can what can they expect from a career? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's much more interesting than just working nine to five. It's it's interesting. It's creative. You can be really passionate about what you do. 
can experiment, which is the best thing about it, and obviously make mistakes along the way, but that's the only way you're going to learn, really, from making mistakes. And again, as Rob was saying, like, chefs, like, giving you the chance to cook, it's, it's more of an opportunity now. A lot of chefs do it now. They let you kind of just have your own, like, hour or so, create a recipe, and then you've got to be able to take a bit of criticism as well, because nof nothing's ever going to be perfect, and everything can always be improved. <coughs> Otherwise, you would be a mission star chef, wouldn't you? So... You know, um, yeah, I think you can expect like a lot of fun, be creative, and yeah, you can be absolutely bonkers, really. Like, just <laughs> have like a right laugh with everyone. You work like if you work in like with a good team as well. You are working long hours, but it goes quickly because the kind of job you're doing, you're not sitting down all day. You're walking around, you're doing loads of different jobs. It's it's interesting because you're doing one job one one minute and the next job you're doing another. And then service is like the best part for me. Like I love service because. It, you just don't even think about what, uh, anything else. You just con concentrate on what's going on that night. And it's the best feeling in the world, like, when you've completed a service. It's manic, isn't it? When you, like, if you're fully booked, you know, you've got a busy restaurant and um, you think, oh, how are we going to do this? We're short-staffed. We've got two people. It's the best, actually, when, when you're short-staffed. It's actually when you end up having the best service because yeah. <laughs> everyone's on their game <laughs> and everyone just, like, absolutely smashes it. Brilliant. <laughs> David, what about you? Um, what can they expect from the from a career in, in the in this industry? You can make some really really good friends, uh, meet some really great people. You'll make friendships that'll last for years and years. And there's a lot of good people, all fighting for the same goal, whether they're carrying plates or dressing plates, and whether the people, people do the laundry or people that do the maintenance and stuff like that. You'll make a, a, a massive demographic of people that will become friends for life, really. And Eka. I think uh, on the previous point we sort of bashed the old school way of doing things and I know it's not always hugs and high fives but let's be honest it's you do need that in order to to enjoy success because that what that old school mentality brought into especially me was discipline that's what I needed and it's allowed me to do all I've done but you know the, the industry moving forward what can you expect it's what you can expect is what you're willing to put in yourself. I mean, if you're looking for a nice, easy ride, then that's all you're going to get. You're, you're not going to achieve anything in this industry. This industry literally is one you get what you put in. And a lot of people ask, oh, you know, they, they 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 say, you know, you're lucky or you're this, you're that. No, it's it's hard work. You put hard work. You, you're dedicated to it, as with any like footballers. They might be going out there kicking a ball for 90 minutes, but what about all the years of training that goes into it? It's, it's all boils down to the work that you put in. So this industry is an industry where truly it's an honest industry. You, you put the work in, you, you show the dedication, and you will reap the rewards. And no disrespect for those roles who are in, in an admin and so on and so forth. Well, you know, you're part of a cog, and you, 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 know, you, you process paper, bang it out, done. Whereas with hospitality, there's a lot more to it. You know, you get to express your personality, your creativity, so many outlets, and it's just so enriching. But once again, it all boils down to you as individuals. If you're willing to put the work in, you will reap rewards. I'm, I've got no education. I have nothing. No, on paper, deadly squat. But I'd like to say, you know, I've managed to achieve a, a decent amount for, for, for someone of my age and my background. And that all came purely from hard work. And, and my dedication. So if you're willing to work hard and you're willing to dedicate yourself to the industry, you will, you will for sure enjoy success. Brilliant. Well, I think you'll agree there's been some brilliant points made there. I hope that you all take something away from this. But um, I'm going to stop asking questions now, and it's your turn to ask questions. So does anybody have any questions for the panel? Just pop your hand up. Who? Someone must have a question. Who's got, who's got a question? Come on, don't be shy. I, I've got a question for David. David, what's the scariest ride at Orton's House and have you ridden it? <laughs> the oblivion scares me. <laughs> have you been on it? Yes, I have. How many times? Four. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a row, I hope. <laughs> in a row of days, yeah. Oh. <laughs> one after the other. Neil. Oh, thanks. That was really, really informative. Just sort of jump in between the lines a little bit. Um, 
in the papers and the, the journals and the press, uh, we get a lot of talk from the industry that catering colleges, universities, you know, breed dinosaurs and we don't really always create, um, like students ready, industry ready. Um, I've had comments that, uh, you know, they've got the wrong attitude, the wrong skill set, wrong mindset. And then sometimes from our point of view, we can spend, invest quite a bit of time trying to get people ready, got a lot of enthusiasm, etc. And then they can enter the industry and three months later, they don't want to be in it anymore. So what do you think we could do sort of together to solve that sort of problem so that retention is a lot better? Because we still lose a significant amount of people in that journey. I'd say, I'd say, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say to give obviously the students an opportunity of working in a professional kitchen um, because in a way there's so many different types of kitchens. Like someone might want to go into the Michelin, someone might want to go into fine dining, hotel, brasserie restaurants, or someone might want to just work in the sandwich shop. Everyone's different. Um, I would personally say, for whatever direction they're looking to go into, to give them that specific um, level of experience. So working in a restaurant for two weeks, but you know, so they do do that anyway, don't they? They get to go and work, and yeah, but they need they need to work more with the chefs, I think. Like not just given like rubbish jobs. Maybe this is something that can be discussed with whoever they go to. I know some restaurants are really good at just like actually teaching them and spending time with them. Not all restaurants get the time to do that, but that's something that they should definitely do. Definitely the work experience side of it. I think for me, uh, obviously Neil and I have known each other for years, but I think um, and I, what I'd like to see change is, I know they have their placement, which is set at certain parts in their uh, curriculum, but if, if anything, that needs to be made more of a regular thing. So whether that be in every month, one particular week, so they've got constant touch points with the industry and they actually know exactly what to expect because you're right, you know, sometimes they, they may leave uh, academia with uh, students uh, with uh, maybe uh, an impression of what they expect but then the reality is far, far removed from that which then creates shock whether they decide to stay or move on. Whether that's if that that's already nurtured and they know the nature of the beast, as it were, what is the industry, and they're already uh, attuned with it, then I think you will get more of it. Because essentially, it's if everyone's if they're signed up for the course, they clearly have some enthusiasm for the industry and and, and cooking, but they probably don't fully understand. Because once again, I know we've both done. TV and stuff like that. And I, I, when we get a lot of young kids in, a lot of things that—that's what they think. That's what the industry is about. They forget the the ninety-nine percent of what we actually do on a daily basis. And yeah, sometimes it is boring stuff. Now I spent one day well, peeling onions. I went in and peeled fifty kilos of onions. I mean, I did it. But it's a job that needs to be done. So it's not always glamorous, and it's not always cameras in front of you, and it's not always about. Pla you know, tweezers and, and plates. You know, th there are the bits of it which which <laughs> which, which which we all which we all. That's the reality, and I think if if un everyone understands that, they'll they'll have will have more retention. And I think it's just about more touch points with the industry and spending more time in the industry whilst they're. Uh, and I think that will they'll be able to feed that back in to their work at college as well. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, structured work placements uh, is certainly thing in my mind. Also, it's sort of lacking from a college perspective. Um, I know there's just a set amount of work experience that needs to be done as part of the curriculum, but I think that needs to be readdressed because the need to be the, as a student, you need to sort of find what it's like to be in a working environment, and we can sort of meet you halfway and get you pay 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 some of it. However, that's what I think needs to change. It needs to be more of a gradual sort of phase into a full-time job rather than you've done your three years right away you go because that's not really isn't working from my perspective. Any other? Yes. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Sorry. <coughs> go. I was only going to agree with what that said. It's very, just more time in professional kitchens. 
like Akhtar said, maybe once a month they come and spend, maybe not a whole week, but two or three days a month in a kitchen. But if they go to the same kitchen, it becomes more familiar as well. So and I'd, I'd, I know I'd work with the college and say, like, if they want to come for six months, once a month, two or three times a week, it would be, it, it'd be a lot more when they get let out into the real world. Like three years after a course, after the three year course, it's a little, it might be a little bit less daunting and easier for them to sort of adapt. Uh, just go to that lady there first, because she had a hand up first. If you can just introduce yourself to the panel and then ask the panel the question. Hello, I'm Clarissa, and I'm doing Level 2 Professional Cookery. Um, for the people who are wondering about whether to go on to higher education, for example, food development and innovation or culinary arts management, do you think it's worth doing this to help get a better job in the kitchen? Or... Would it, would it be better just to go straight into the kitchen after finishing education? It's a hard one, isn't it? Because when, when I was at college, I didn't really get that opportunity to do that. But I did my level one and my level two, and I had the <coughs> option to do level three. Um, but because I was working part-time, I kind of took a full, on a full-time job. For me, I learnt more in that kitchen than I did at college. That's not to say everyone's like that. Um, I do kind of, looking back at it, wish that I stayed at college a bit longer because then I wouldn't have had so much responsibility and I could just have fun for another year. But <laughs> um, it's having your own independency as well, like being able to save up for your first car and whatever, stuff like that. Um, but now, but looking back at it, I never needed it. So I've got my level three now. I did that. You can do a lot of um, apprenticeships within your workplace as well. Some places offer this. Not everyone does, but I did my level three whilst at work. So... Um, I would say it's it's a it's a hard it's a hard question because they're only recently bringing the higher levels of education in now, um, but I wouldn't necessarily say in most areas of the industry you'd need that because it's more about working somewhere at a young age, um, earning respect, learning in the kitchen, and having that experience behind you more than anything. Okay, thank you. I think for me, we should never discount the. Uh the the importance and the value of education i think for a man without any education it seems quite uh, uh somewhat uh ironic i you know, it's it's something that i envy and if you have the opportunity to do so while still keeping your uh, hand in the industry so remember we're, we're incredibly we're a practical industry our, our roles it's a practical role we cook we 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 take ingredients and we transform it to something else and we do that by by our hands so yes we've got the practical side the physical side of it but then it's always good to have that the ac academia I mean uh, it's it's very important I say and if you can do both and if, if it suits your uh, your path in life then yeah I mean I'd, I'd, I'd recommend it 100% and you put just as much effort into uh, the actual job itself and also remember that after doing that course you will when you finish off you'll no doubt still start off at the bottom so as long as it fits off fits into your your plans and your life goals then yeah I'd say do it I think yeah I think it depends, it depends on the individual as well I think like Axel just said if, if you're going to go to higher education I think you still need to keep your hand in and maybe get a part-time job after after your education I've got a lad who works for me now who, who I offered into it instead of he going into his third year. I offered him to do an apprenticeship, finish his third year as an apprentice with us. He turned it down, but I still I still kept him on as part time. And now he's, well, he's he's my junior sous chef now, and he's 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 doing really well for himself. And but he did four nights a week out of the five nights we were open still, and all day on a Saturday with us while still at college. And he'd be travelling, he'd be getting up at six o'clock in the morning to get to college early. And then he'd be coming to work afterwards to work with us for service, and he'd be setting the set, he'd be setting the canopy section up or, or the snack section as we call it these days. He'd be setting that up as soon as he got in, and then working service, finishing probably some nights eleven o'clock midnight, and then still up for college the next day. So, but he's he he's reaping the rewards for it now. He's he's twenty two. He's my junior sous chef. He's I've just I've just done a reference for him, reference for him this morning to go into maths to get professionals, which. The ways it is, so <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that. But, oh well. No one's watching. No, I haven't, I haven't said. I haven't said his name. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, you, you get out what you put in, and 
if you're going to do higher education, then do probably have to do a bit more as well. Just so you've got it, and it goes on your CV. Yeah, that's what I look at when I take someone on. Look, like I look at the CV, not necessarily if they're young, like at the start of their career. Then I look at what they've what their education. But in five years' time, I look at where they've worked, how long they've worked there for, and yeah. Do you like people to stay? For a certain period of time, is it is it something that puts you off if you see people being quite transient in their in their CV? I always say I think two years is a good good amount, eighty at least eighteen months. I think if you do twelve months here, twelve months there, you're not seeing you're not one that the place where they're working isn't getting the full benefit of that person. Because I think it takes probably nine ten months to get someone to work in your way and get them thinking the way you think and how you think about food and cooking your style. But and then I think after that they're learning from you, from from the from the kitchen they're working in, from all the other chefs in that kitchen. So I think eighteen months, two years is a really good good amount of time to spend somewhere. I think any less than that, then I think you're just jumping around too much, and you're probably not getting the benefit of that mm. that place they're working for. Okay, thank you very much. There was a gentleman over there. Just time for one more question. Is it you, sir? So if you can just. Introduce yourself to the panel and then ask the question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm a third year culinary arts management student. Uh, my question is sort of, um, if you imagine a sort of traditional head chef, uh, classically trained, you imagine someone quite old. And as you can see um, with the panel we've got in front of us, there's sort of a theme nowadays to have young and successful chefs. So my question really is, I know there's a fine line between uh, being young and being ready. So. And for myself, I know I'm a victim of that. Like, I really want to be successful as, as, as a young chef, but I also want to have the knowledge. So my question really is, when did you feel ready to take on that managerial uh, role? Did, were, you, were you told you know, that you're ready to step up, or did you just feel it naturally that I have the ability to sort of lead a team in that sense? Personally, I don't think you, you're never ready for it. You, you learn it, the management side, you learn on the job, I think. Or you never know. Because, like Akhtar said, you forget when you get head chef, you, you sort of, if you're just head chef and you're cooking, you still have, there's still a lot of other things to do when you're head chef. And at sous chef as well, you still got a, there's still things that the head chef will rely on the sous chef to do that isn't just about cooking. So I think get, I think there's a lot a lot of young chefs trying to become sous chef at 21, 22 these days. And I think you know it's probably too soon. You probably need to have seen a couple of kitchens first, seen a few different styles as well, and then and then probably think about it like. You know, I don't think you, you can't put age on anything. I don't think. I mean, you do as maybe you do, but don't set it too low because you could set yourself up. It's you know, you, you go in. You, if you're 22 and you're going to speak, you, you apply for a sous chef job somewhere, and you you might get that job, but you might you don't know what it's going to be like when you get in the kitchen. Like interviews are very different to actual real life when you get in that kitchen. I think just take your time and don't don't jump at the first chance of becoming a manager or becoming a senior person in the kitchen, it's important to learn the basics and learn, learn to cook first before you learn to learn to lead people. That'll come naturally, I think, when you get a look as, as, you, as you get into the kitchens. Yeah. I think that's the thing that you mentioned earlier on, that obviously there's a l aspiration is a great thing because that's what drives you to succeed and you know, that it's great to have that drive, but you've got to be realistic and you've got to be honest with yourself as well. And, and like Rob said, this is something that we see quite often. We get a lot of young, uh, enthusiastic chefs who, because they've read a f few of Heston's books, they've decided now they're going to sh show you how the future of the industry. But you can't put price or, or you know, or remove the importance of experience and experience comes with time uh, a lot of people are obviously for myself a lot of stuff happened earlier but what people forget is I started cooking when I was 13 professionally like I say it ruined my parents life but I, I gave <laughs> school and everything and it, it, there's a lot of stuff that was just wrong and you know obviously illegal at the time blah 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 but my parents <laughs> had no way to control me because I was quite a wayward wayward child but and I, I decided and restaurants and restaurant kitchens where I found a home. So yeah, um, but that was a long time ago. And But for me, by the time I'd got my first kitchen, I'd done it for nearly 10 years. So, you know, you guys leaving college at, you know, 21 or whatever, or 19, 20, and then by the age of 21, 22, deciding you're ready for management, 
is that is that are you being honest to yourself? Are you is is it right? Are you being fair to yourself? Are you being fair to fair to the industry? Uh, that's the question you need to ask yourself. So I'd say before you can take that sort of responsibility, because remember responsibility it's not about I like, say serving a few customers that night and making sure a few pretty plates of food go out. As management, as 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 someone who's responsible for your colleagues, you know, you're, you've got a responsibility to your colleagues to make sure that they're in an environment that's good for them in every possible way. You've got a responsibility to the business as well. You're you, you are responsible to make sure, come the end of every month, the business is in a position to support the livelihoods of every person that's involved in that business. And as a head chef or someone who's buying in the core product to that the business sells in order to that you're very much responsible for that. And then to ensure that come the end of the year, the business is in a great position in order to move forward again, that's a great amount of responsibility, and that only comes with time. And so I would say to everyone else, slow down a bit, take it all in. I know we live in a world now, I, I've got a son who's 11, and uh, he's, he's very different to how I thought at that time. And we've got, like I said, a lot of young students, like Trey, who works with us. You know, it is a simple case of, slowing down and and take it all in and everything will come in time but you need to and I, I, I really appreciate what, you, what you're trying to say and your aspiration you're clearly very aspirational but I will say my friend pull it back and learn 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 and then when you're ready you know you're ready yeah, uh, d don't get me wrong. I wasn't saying I want to be a head chef at 23 or anything. I'm just, yeah, yeah so I'm just asking, like, from your perspective, because I know you were quite successful at a young age, but obviously that makes sense because you started a lot earlier. So yeah, exactly. in that sense, for you, you knew it was ready because you had a lot of experience from a young age. So that's it. So yeah. it's, it's all about time. So when you say the old school, yeah, we all started off a lot earlier, mm -hmm. and and it was 10, 12 years before you even thought about it. So it's different for everyone because um, you don't have to be head chef to be successful in your career and you've got to be honest to yourself at the end of the day if you if you know that you can do better and you know you're not ready for that position it's better to just stay, take a step back because people around you respect you a lot more for that as well and when, it's, when you're ready for it you're ready for it and you know you do the job a lot better at the time um, well, don't get me wrong the older you are the more experience you've got but that's not always true because some people don't go in, in, into the industry until they're about 20 so for them, it's slightly different. So you could you could also say for that they might think they will be head chef by t by thirty, but then they've only got ten ten years experience behind them. So it's different for everyone, and it depends on where you work as well. If you're running like a multi restaurant, like hotel brasserie, it's like head chef, exec head chef, taking control of not only what's going out in the kitchen, but taking care of all the paperwork side of things as well. So it just depends where what you go into. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, I wondered what you were doing then. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right, so yeah, thank you very much for you all uh, for coming and for giving your time today. And I hope, like I said earlier, that you've all taken. Uh, something from this and you're not disappearing straight off so if you do have any questions that you didn't want to ask in front of everybody then please do speak to them afterwards but a round of applause for the panel please <laughs>